boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Really excited to be sitting down with Lance Victor Moore talking about fashion design. Woo! That's the, that's the name of the game, man. Thank you for coming on to the show. My pleasure. I'm really excited. Yeah, there's so much to talk about. This is a very artistic exhibit that you have here. <laughs> and this Curated show just for you. Yes, and it's super avant-garde. And it's also very, it's very interesting because it's very different. It's very, it has an edge to it. It's futuristic. Oh, so. There's, yeah, there, I mean, there's, a, there's absolutely a, a big part of futurism in what I do. I, I've always been a fan of uh, sci-fi, which I probably, is relatively self-evident. But um, when I say futurism, I don't necessarily just mean it has to look futuristic. I mean, the product itself should look towards the future in the way that it's not just produced, but what its um, content is, uh, how, yeah. why it's produced. Because um, you have sustainable methods in the way that you do as this. As much as I can. I mean, obviously there are things in it that I have no control over and, and I'm not at a point in where I produce things yet where I can have control over that. But when I'm able to, I try and make sure that pieces that I use, whether it's leather or bone or animal parts or um, having fabrics laser cut or made that it's done in a way that's sustainable or at least low impact yeah. to environmental standards just because that's I think the only real way for fashion to go forward it, like the animals already passed and then you can in general yeah I mean nothing leather. nothing that I use there were no animals harmed specifically to make this product generally they're secondary use products or um, the animal died naturally and the bones or the the pieces that I used were harvested um, usually for taxidermy or for schools things like that I get a lot of things through a company called Paxton Gate yep. um, and uh, they do a lot of things for taxidermy and, and stuff especially when I'm using things like you know teeth or bones or horn even seed pods, things like that. So. Yeah, and okay, so before we continue going into the nuance on all of this, which I'm really excited to unpack with you, tell us about how you got here, because you're born in New York. Yes, I was born on Long Island and uh, grew up there, and then moved to the city when I was about 14 or 15. Um, not completely on my own and not completely not on my own and, and enjoyed New York for a few years and um, and then went to school. Uh, went to school at Cooper Union and had a great time there. I went for painting. Uh, I was a painter. My, my parents are both artists in their own way. Uh, my father is a painter so I always assumed that would be the path I would take. Mm -hmm. uh, and I still do a lot of painting and what I use. I use an airbrush quite a lot on what I use. Uh, and, and what I make, um, I use a lot of hand painting skills when I want to get a patina or a shading right on things. So I, I certainly use it in that way. Um, and right now, outside of fashion, I'm working on a commission right now of a painting of prints of all things Whoa. Um, for somebody. So yeah, you know, I, I still I still use it. But this came about. Um, I'd always sewn. I'd always made things and costumes when I was a kid. Um, my mother uh, had a sewing machine and, and basically said, you know, if you want to learn how to make all these things that you want, that's great. We'll get you a sewing machine and you can make it yourself. So mm -hmm. I did. One of the first things I ever made, there's an old David Bowie movie called Labyrinth. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wore a leather jacket in it and I wanted that leather jacket because I wanted to be David Bowie. So I made my own version out of crap. <laughs> I got it at thrift stores and, um, and kind of picked it up that way. So I'd always made things and I had a lot of friends who were in nightclubs and, in, and you know, when I was living in New York, I was sort of a little bit of a club kid, so mm -hmm. I definitely made my own things. And, um, and then when I moved here, I sort of focused more on the painting aspect. And then a friend of mine, Emily Payne, uh, who is a remarkably good uh, fashion designer on her own right, um, she was invited with her brand at the time, Leather Tongue, uh, to show at New York Fashion Week in 2016. Mm -hmm. And Emily knew that I liked sculpture because in my paintings I use a lot of three-dimensional things. I don't just paint straight out. A lot of it is 
built out and sculptural, and so it, there's a 3D aspect to some of my painting. It's, it's a cross between sculpture and painting. And she had asked me if I wanted to make some masks uh, for her show, the idea being that a lot of her clothing is uh, androgynous, it's sort of asexual. Mm -hmm. And so the masks were a way of obscuring the model's faces so you weren't necessarily drawn to the gender one mm -hmm. way or another, and mm -hmm. it was just about the clothing Interesting. line. Yeah. The design of them came from the idea of punk to a certain degree, so um, there is a little bit of uh, tribalism and, and soft painting in some of the prints that Emily used. And so we went with the idea of, well, there's a bit of an Afrikaans feel to some of it. What would kids in Africa who don't have maybe access to the same sort of materials that we have here, punk, riot, punk rock wise, mm -hmm. go for? Mm -hmm. And so gravitated towards using things that were natural. I said, you know, from far away, this will look like mm -hmm. a mohawk of you know, huge spikes and then you get closer and you see that it's all porcupine quills and mm -hmm. things, things that you would have naturally found from the land or, yeah. so that's where that idea stemmed from. Um, and then uh, the masks went uh, on the runway and people seemed to really like them. I sold half of what I produced that first round. Whoa. Which was great. Yeah. yeah. So definitely made me feel like people liked what I was doing. Yes. Um, so. So, holy cow, all right, so I guess one of the first things that you said that I thought was really interesting was this, was this, uh, the, <clears throat> the ability to use a mask to sort of uh, make it so that the people that are observing the person that is wearing whatever they are wearing to be, uh, to make it androgynous or asexual so that it is, so well, they're focused more on the clothing or the fashion rather than the gender of the person. There's that aspect too, but also just masks in general have been around for forever and in every culture they have their own version, whether it's a kabuki mask or um, you know, a mask they would have worn in the Renaissance to go to um, you know, a big ball at a palace. Uh, masks are a way for people to very quickly change their uh, persona yeah. without having to do much. And by having that barrier between yourself and someone else, I think it gives people a bit of a license to be a little, a little outside of their comfort zone That's and not cool. take full responsibility for it because yeah. you've already put on this second layer. So there's that to it also. But I think, you know, whether it's a mask or a t-shirt, what we wear mm -hmm. as people uh, dictates a lot of what we want to present to the rest of the world about what our interests are, our values are, or even yeah. what our hierarchy is. Um, certainly with the kind of stuff that I create, um, there's an aspect of don't fuck with me. You know, yeah. that, that aspect. I mean, yeah. for anybody who would wear something of mine, you're obviously not a wallflower. Um, so I think that's my aesthetic. Yeah, I mean, you take a look at some of your, you know, your Instagram account is linked in the in the bio below, and when you look through some of this this content, it's it's cool that you can actually see people that are rocking the same sort of idea that you're talking about right here. Like in this photo, <clears throat> this is your friend um, Vanessa Getty. This is Vanessa. Yeah, she's and in, in the, the center. center. And and, and made the big, crown that she's wearing on that. And she's a su big supporter of, of you. She is. So she's a big supporter of the arts in general. Um, yes. She really likes to make sure that people that she's had a good experience with are, are represented. And she always makes sure that people know whoever it is created, what she's wearing, gets credit for it. And, and she's a lovely person, too. So. And, and here, you, you, know, you mentioned, like, again, you made this. Yeah, um, if you go to the Instagram account, click on it, you can go to the next picture and you actually see the, the crown itself. Wow. So that's what it, what it ended up being. Yeah. Um, and look at that. Look, and that's so cool that it's so intricate. It really know, is. You know, a lot of engineering goes into something like that. So Absolutely. Which, now, now, I want to stay on something that you said because I, I can't let it escape. Hmm. You have these, you know, you have this you know, what these women are wearing here, right? They are covering like half of their, half of their face. When you're wearing these masks, and even when you, you know, when you pull up an image like this as well, 
when you when you're covering half of your face or when you're covering your eyes mm. the, um, the area around your eyes the other part has to sort of take up that slack to be able to um, convey to people um, and you've been you were talking about it in a way that was expressing to us especially to me right now I didn't really think about it to the extent at which you just taught me about it which was that for hundreds of years now we've been we've been wearing things the face is kind of a it's like the most it's the way that someone knows you the most is through well, your face well it's your most common social barometer i mean social it, barometer i mean it is, is. you know yeah. you can tell a lot from someone whether or not they make direct eye contact with you or if they're constantly darting all over yeah and then in the same way by looking at someone's mouth whether you can see it or not um, you know without a mask Someone gets nervous and their lips will start to quiver or, you know, they'll lick their lips the yeah. whole time. Mm -hmm. Being able to cover that up to a certain degree allows you to have a bit more control of what you want to present to someone. So there's a reason of that. I mean, there's a reason why indigenous people would put on masks before they would have a huge ceremony or, or whether it was for, uh, you know, a, a tribal rite or for a wedding. Those they allowed them to up the ante for their emotional state, I think, to a certain degree, and take it to another level that without that armor, which is really what it is, yeah. um, it's hard for people to get to that point if they're not someone who's naturally outgoing. Oh, that's so interesting that, you know, you... So, I mean, a lot of, it's a weird thing to say, but I hear more times than not when people have tried on one of my masks that they feel like it allows them to be a lot more free, which is funny when you're putting yeah. something on your face, and taking away some of your natural ability to emote. But I think uh, it also allows you to tap into a part of yourself that maybe you're not naturally inclined to. Uh, this is, oh, this is cool. You, 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 you know, just b before you get here, the, you, you That's use That's my friend Jared, by the way, he's awesome, and he uh, fixes motorcycles, and a pretty cool guy. Hey, Jared. <laughs> shout out to shout, your, out to shout out to friends that are supporting artists. He helped me move into my entire studio downstairs. Wow. Like came in yeah. and helped me build stuff, and he's a pretty awesome guy. So, I I, I know your studio is so cool. Um, it's in the same building as we're in, which is you know it's a it's a reason why we met, and I'm really yeah. happy. I'm really happy that that we did. Um, now, okay, you use the word social barometer. I think that's so interesting. Um, and so you're you're talking, and and these the idea of masks or 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 covering parts of this major social barometer to more enable us to feel more free but see, in some ways. But masks are are, are 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 one of the things that I use for my aesthetic. But it's not just that. It's it's any piece of clothing that you use can be is almost always a social barometer. If a guy decides he wants to wear a t-shirt and the sleeves are cut off because he wants to show off his muscles, that's a social barometer of saying, I'm showing you a part of me that I consider to be dominant and that that's will right. make me feel like I'm in charge and masculine or conveying a certain stance. Um, or if a woman decides that she wants to either be buttoned up to here or that she wants to be less buttoned up to have here. some cleavage showing or have some muscle showing right. that it's, some it's a way showing. of saying this is what i'm comfortable with presenting and this part i'm not comfortable presenting so um it's a schematic like you right know. now you're you have your tats you know you have right. tats on your arms and you know you're wearing a short sleeve so people can see that right but if i were say going to church which yeah. unlikely perhaps <laughs> <laughs> perhaps i wouldn't do that although in my mind i probably would do it i'd probably wear the yeah. you know the cutoff t-shirt to show off more of it the, i imagine a lance victor yeah. more in some other or gold short shorts or that's something. going to church and like having a yeah you'd, you'd be surprised I, I i i i have nothing against church i have a lot against say organized religion but sure, that's sure. a different thing yeah totally um and so it'd be it'd be funny to see like a group of 12 people walking into church wearing your masks the church of lance victor Moore. the church of lance that's right. okay that's right. so that was so fascinating the social Can you imagine barometer. my eucharist that would be pretty interesting <laughs> <laughs> i i love i love how much you know you, this this is actually the one that's right here that is yeah yep. that's that mask and so yeah you can and okay so now here would be a good segue mm. to go into this you were talking about another thing that you were mentioning at the very beginning was you were mentioning the um, 
the amount of nature that is ev evidently yeah. visible. You were saying that if you were in, in Africa and you were making masks, you know, you'd probably be making it with some sort of these of these bones. Well, at least or that these... part. Maybe not with the you know the fabric part here, but yeah, yeah. yeah. And then here, what were these called? This this was so, an Australian. Seed so on this mask, yeah, yeah. So this mask, I'll hold it up or whatever. So there's actually a lot of um, reclaimed uh, pieces in this. Uh, the skin is a python skin, and it's actually from the '60s. I bought it. This second... is python skin, right? Yeah. Here. The skin itself is from the '60s. Yeah, I've had it forever. Um, I bought it um, Whoa. on a little online auction. So, um, and again, it was rolled up in this lady's uh, attic or something, and she went through it and she put all this stuff. And she's like, I remember my mom went to, to Zanzibar or something, and she bought all these skins, and I want to get rid of them, so I bought one. So, damn. Um, damn. And then these pieces here are actually called a devil's claw. Devil's I believe, claw. if I'm correct, they're from Australia. Mm -hmm. They are actually seed pod, and they grow in a tree, uh, and it's a barb. It's so that the tree can uh, protect itself. Um, yeah, you can probably look up one if you uh, devil's devil's claw. Right, there right. you go. There's one right the, there. Like this. One, the, yeah, these guys here. Yeah, those guys here. Okay, all oh, those guys. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what they look like naturally. Um, incredibly Devil's strong. Devil's claw fruits. Yeah, but it's it's a seed pod, and the inside. I mean, I guess it's probably a nut or something. <clears throat> but the inside um, is hollow. But these parts here are actually incredibly strong. They're really flexible. Whoa. Um, yeah. And what I understand is that people, indigenous people, actually will break them off and use them either for earrings or use them to even hang garments of clothing. Same Whoa. way that we would use um, a, a, a clothing a clothing line hook. So they'll use these and hang them all over trees to, to clothe, you know, wash their garments or to hang skins um, in that way. So, and then the inside is lined in, in just regular uh, uh, leather skin. Now, I mean, the way that you break this down is just so interesting because you, this is not a, you know, this takes, this is what. There's a uh, lot of engineering is this like that's a, going on in it. Is this a multi, like, is this like a 40 hour mask? Oh, easily. This, I mean, something like that. The engineering part is the hardest because I have to decide what what I want it to look like and how I want it to extend out, and then how to get it there and still keep it light, uh, keep it breathable, and more importantly, make sure that things aren't going to start to slope on it. So if you look on the inside of it, let's look on the inside. Yeah, the inside. Um, first off, you'll be able to see that it's incredibly light. So that's one of the things that people usually are not prepared for with my mask. They're like, oh, yeah. it's like, like um, what are you at? Is this, is this one pound? Oh, it's less than a pound. It's like half a pound. Yeah, no, it's less than a pound. Yeah. It's probably about yeah. 12 ounces. 12 ounces, yeah. Wow. Um, it's very, very light. Yeah, no, it, it's true. And, and all it, the pieces on it also uh, are detachable because obviously if I'm sending it to someone in Japan, I can't send it like this. So these pieces, the front piece, they all come off and they can be re, re put on wherever you, you go in. Show but us the, how easy it is to take off the pieces if you want to sure. send it to like Japan yeah. or something. I'm not sure I even need a, I don't think I even need a. Just like that, look at that. Yeah. You gotta just screw right in and screw right out like that, mm -hmm. huh? So, wow, that's look one at, of the pieces. Look at how easy that oh, there's was. There's a screw there, so you don't so want to hold it. You want to, don't want to lose yeah. it, yeah. But, wow. But that, that way, just these things can be that completely, is. you know, and this whole thing here was, you know, it's it's, it's drilled in and there's a pin that goes inside of it. Yep. And, yep. So, um, wow. and then it's screwed back on and easy breezy. But then there's a metal rod on the inside that actually holds all the weight of these and keeps them in place. So there's a lot of understructure. Um, inside of this, there's two layers. There's an inside layer of leather on the outside. And the inside has a wire mesh. So the entire mask is also flexible and can be shaped to people's faces and be comfortable. So you can bend it so it fits your jawline better, or fits around your nose better, all these things. Um, you did good. Yeah, actually, and it's interesting that it pretty much screws right back into the same Right, I mean, you can, the you can, and you can kind of twist them so that you make sure that everything stays nice and on the inside maybe screw them. But, yeah. but in general, I try and make it easy for people because good design is usually simple design. Good design is usually simple. Design. You know, I mean, yeah. not that something incredibly complex isn't good design, but what I have found is people don't want to have to be too finicky. Other way, that way, 
There you go. That goes on the bridge of the nose. Because it's got to go on the bridge of the yeah, nose. Yeah, just like that. You want me to clip it on you? <clears throat> so generally, it's worn higher on the head, and they're adjustable. Uh, also, you know, I have a big very, head. Very, well, that's why there's elastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Interesting. There you go. How's that feel? Wow. This is pretty cool. Because <laughs> there's just, there's something really interesting about having these, you know, be right in your sight of vision. But they don't obscure too much. They don't I obscure, mean, you know, yeah. And again, I think one of the things is you have to be in the mindset for it. Uh, this is something where... This makes me like, this makes me want to like move around and get excited and like go and show the world like, look at, look at what I'm wearing right now because it's so, it's beautiful. It's, it's, well, so, it's so different, you know? It's well, not your conventional, it's not your conventional I'm wearing a just like a, you know, a t-shirt and, and, and pants. But right. And again, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's like anything it's within context. This is not something you're probably going to wear every day, but what I've, what I have found it's almost empowering. across, almost across the board is that people who purchase my masks or, or, or any of what I create, they tend to wear it to one particular function they have in mind. Uh, I had a, a couple, uh, last year, uh, a friend of mine who runs a blog called Styletti. Uh, she actually purchased a mask for herself and for her husband, a matching set, uh, and they wore it to um, this big black and white soiree. They both, he wore a tux and she wore a, a Givenchy dress. Yeah. And then after they wore them, uh, they hung them on their wall as an art piece, and now exactly, it yeah. becomes this sort of art piece, this, in this their piece home that they can talk to about people. When and people come that? over, yeah. So it's 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 cool in that way, you know. You, another thing that I really like about this... Usually worn high on the head. Higher on the head. Yep. Think of it like a facelift. It's got to have a little bit of pull going up. Yeah, so that, like this. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. So now, another thing that I notice about this is that you have these holes here. Well, yeah, obviously and you that's have to make breathing. it breathable for people. Yeah. So. And it's actually quite, you know, it's quite breathable in that sense. Well, and that's also one of the earlier masks that I made. Some of the ones that I made further on... I tried to incorporate even more ease of wear. Uh, the one behind you, if you look at it, yes. the copper one. If you take a look at the inside of that one, it's actually, um, it's a hand hold leather. So the leather has actually been burned out on it. But the entire understructure of it is actually a wow. fine wire mesh that's copper. So. That one is an incredible amount of breathability, um, and that one. Oh yeah, because uh, yeah, 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 the breathability. And that one is, is on one. four ounces. Four ounces. The entire piece is four Super ounces, light. so yeah. it's incredibly light. Um, oh my gosh, this is so light. Yeah, that's something that you can you can completely breathe in. And look at look at the yeah look at how 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 uh, transparent it is because it's a copper mesh. It's a copper mesh and then it's burnt leather, you said, on the outside? Uh, it's hand, um, hand rolled leather. Oh, so the inside rolled. of it has got holes that have been made. I burned the holes and then I went in and rolled it. So it would give it a texture. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Um, um, you know, I wanted to say this about the... I'm going to loosen it a little bit because you have a big head. I have a big head, yeah. <laughs> so right here, it just has a little notch. And then you just pull that, yeah. yeah. I'd say that's probably going to fit you better. Okay. The... Something else that I wanted to mention about these, I mean, holy cow, this one's so light. You just pull it. You're, gonna, you're not going to break it, I promise. This one's so, this one's so breathable. Yeah, holy so cow. I've, I've definitely figured out as I've gotten, how do I get a cool look, but that's very easy to, feels, to work with. You know, this feels See, different. See, that one actually yeah. looks really, out of the two of them, I actually like that one on you better because I feel like it's a little, to me, it's a little slicker for you. Yeah. This one um, might be I can see you like wearing that with a leather jacket or something and going mm -hmm. to the right club and mm -hmm. being the vampire guy in the corner mm -hmm. with your two yeah, yeah, yeah. tusks okay. sticking out. Those are porcupine quills. These are porcupine quills? Yeah, those are porcupine quills that are projecting from it. Um, Let's take a look at them. Yeah. So how does, so now... Um, okay, and again, those screw on. And, like, and screw off. Yeah. And, okay, so now, you know, you know here's, here's a couple questions. 
Um, you know, this requires a, um, a lot of, of, you know, of sourcing of different materials, mm. a lot of designing this mm. so that it, like you said, there's a, it's a multi-hour process mm. of even, you know, of engineering and piecing these things together. Look at, I mean, look at the intricacies here. I'll show you the inside. You know, there's, look at, you know, look at how many of their, the, you know, there's, there's so many and things, rivets, so yeah. rivets, and. And there's piecing on it. And again, with the, that kind of a, this was actually a relatively easy piece to make, but if you look at say something like the piece by your knee, the one that is actually a, it's a cast from a cat's spine. That one is, was a relatively complicated piece to make um, because of the engineering that went into it and also it, to a certain degree um, is articulated. Um, not a lot, but has a little bit of articulation. So this a lot is a of this, cast of a cat's part spine. Part of it, yes, part of it. And then part of it was 3D printed and part of it was hand sculpted. So it's a combination of three things, really. Um, and so I originally designed this uh, on my computer with Photoshop to sort of create the shape that was what I wanted from the side view, which was the you know, the, 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 the profile. Yeah. Um, and then getting it to that point. And so I had purchased a portion of a cat's spine and um, cast it uh, in, wow. in resin and then repeated that casting um, and then sculpted parts of it that I had wanted around the edges to create a better shape. And then the piece behind it here, which is this, this notched piece, that was actually done on a um, 3D printer and then covered. So it's got different aspects to it, but I didn't know where to start on this piece. I knew that I wanted something that had a bit of a skeletal feel to it. Uh, everyone calls this the face hugger, so I've come to be okay with that. However, it was not inspired by Giger, but I love Giger. Um, this, you know, coming up with these types of designs is so interesting because who is like, I'm going to put this Australian devil's, uh, what was it called? The devil's, De devil's claw. Claw yeah. on my face. Or I want to put a, a cat's spine going from my you know, mouth. And it looks like ribs right here, which is yeah. like the ribs. Which is, the, which is definitely the, 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 the aesthetic part of exactly. it. Exactly. And like, look at the way that the, the, the tail curves, or the, the back of the spine this curves This one was up. definitely all about the, um, the side profile. You know, that was, was the... What this was created for was for a photo shoot, again with my friend Emily Payne, um, for one of her dresses, and uh, the model wore this. But it was it was mostly about trying to get this very sleek curvature from the side profile. So I didn't worry so much about how it looked from the front as much as from the side, and I wanted a different shape than what I had been used to doing, which was these sort of all over face pieces. And this one actually has two straps. This one is two straps because I wanted to make sure that the, the centerpiece stayed in place, place yeah, um, and didn't yeah. sort of flop around too much. I don't have them on it right now, but if you look on the inside um, in here, there's actually two areas where there are screw holes that are embedded yeah. because at one point it actually had two flanges that came out this way too and came back, Whoa. but we decided to discard them because we liked this more slick, but those pieces are still there. Um, as residuals of the original design. Holy cow, man. this is so, so, so interesting. But yeah, so a piece like that is, that's for me my favorite way of using um, a computer or using yep. three-dimensional design. What I have seen as an unfortunate aspect of, um, oh, there you go, of the way that 3D design and, and, and 3D printing has been used in, in fashion and, and in a lot of uh, different artistic mediums is that it's used across the board to convey something and I think it takes a, a little bit of the natural human element out of it. I feel like a lot of the best things that I've done with any of my work is the mistakes. Yeah. Um, and a computer in a lot of senses helps take away a lot of the burden of creating a mistake, That's especially right. when it comes to things like symmetry. Um, Measure twice, cut once. Right. Measure yeah. quite, uh, but also, I feel like, especially with design or anything creative, 
it's those mistakes that can make something look more beautiful. It gives it a sense of being touched by a human hand. Mm -hmm. And so I have no interest in making, say, a fully realized piece of clothing or a mask that was done completely on a computer. Because then for me, I feel like it doesn't really, what part of it did I have was involved with? I may have had the initial idea, but there has to be mm -hmm. some sort of human element for it to be interesting to me. So I think that hybrid between using um, a printed piece or a laser cut piece or something that was cut on a, on a, a, a water jet cutter, those are great things to incorporate into something that I did by hand. Yeah. Um, and helps elevate both of those elements more than if they were just by themselves, yeah. which can feel a little cold. Um, You're actually adding quite a bit of technology into the mix. Yeah. Technology and, I love and technology, sustainability. So Engineering That's and Mikey, design That's Mikey, by the way, the one I designed that mask for. And you were, funny enough, the little dot in the middle of his mouth, if you see, yep. Uh -huh. That was one of the few things he requested, because he's a DJ, so we ended up putting a hole there so he could have a straw so he could drink. So he oh, could drink. So, so that's actually drink. big enough for him to put a metal straw, straw that I made through. for him. To that's funny. Funny. Yeah. Anyway. But sorry, you were saying? I was saying that it's so cool that you have so many of these um, design and engineering principles and tools. Um, like Photoshop, you were teaching us about the ability to be able to make something like a, like a, like a, the, the 3D for, for Right. So, I mean, well, patterning is relatively very old old school. I mean, since we've had clothing, we've had patterns for it, even though it was just a buckskin wrapped around us. But everybody wore that same buckskin to say I was part of this particular tribe. Um, there was a standard bearer of this is what that should be. And that, you, you know, dictates you were part of this group or you're part of that group. Um, when actual patterning became a really big thing where it was not just about function, but it was also about fashion, mm -hmm. You know, you're looking at probably about the 1400s, something like that, where people started to create clothing not as a functional device of I need to be covered, but I want to show my status in a real way. Um, so I'm going to create a corset or I'm going to um, have very particular colors that only royals can wear, things like that. But the patterning of it became interesting because it was the first time where people went out of their way to sh change the shape of the human body on purpose. Mm. So you see mm -hmm. men wearing large pantaloons to create a silhouette for them that gave them larger legs and a tinier waist to emphasize below the waist. And there's a reason why that silhouette was created. It was to draw the eyes down so men could basically say, look at my cod piece. Mm. That was that, that beginning mm. of that. Mm -hmm. um, and same thing for women. It was about pulling in the waist to create a corset. And by doing that, you're inevitably because it's, there's only so much you can do with matter. Matter has to go in way, one way or another. You're making one area smaller, you're inevitably gonna make the other parts larger. So the waist becomes smaller and the bosom and the, and the, the butt become bigger. And those all add to that aesthetic you're trying to create. No one really did that before that time because it was not paramount to our survival. Yeah. But we got to a point where we didn't have to necessarily worry about food as much because we had farming. Yeah. We didn't have to worry about <clears throat> where we were living because everyone had a home, Shelter. whether it was a shack or a, or a palace. Mm -hmm. And so people could focus on those things a little bit more. As we got into the industrial age, it, it jumped up a notch 10 times more. When we could not only cut out a pattern of something that we liked for a shirt, but have 400 of them cut for us in a day because of an automated machine, yep. that changed everything for everyone who worked yeah. in that industry. And so in a strange way, because it was so easy to create a very consistent product over and over and over again, inevitably that pendulum swings back and people want something more unique that's one of a kind because they know if I like this pair of jeans from Levi's, I can buy as many of that pair of jeans as I want and it's always gonna be the same thing. It's mm. gonna have the exact same fit, the same sheen, everything's gonna be exact. Where if you say buy something that's bespoke by one particular person mm -hmm. um, who makes only four pairs of jeans a, a week because they yeah. make it all by hand, yeah. you have that ability to say what I'm wearing is unique, unique. and special. Yeah. Um, and so I 
feel like there's we're we're going back in a smaller way to that design to the artisanal bespoke well, culture in a sense fast fashion which is what we 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 call it in the industry is is absolutely here to stay. Um, fast fashion is the big piles of clothing at Costco it's or H and M kind of stuff where it's yeah. it's quick to produce, it's very cheap, and it doesn't last very long. But it doesn't need to last very long because you're only wearing it for a season, if that, or until the next trend hits. Yeah. Um, and and that's it's fine for what it is. I think for a lot of people, it's what they can afford, and especially for younger people. Um, but I'm lucky enough to be able to produce some of the stuff that I enjoy producing and have a small group of people who are very into it um, allow me to continue facilitating that. And that allows me to be one of those people that makes those bespoke pieces yeah. and can still afford a studio here in San Francisco, yep. which very few of my friends who are in design or art can do right now because it's so expensive. So yeah. um, I think having that niche but it's also quality control. I mean, anybody can, you know, throw paint on a canvas and call it a painting. Um, I think there's a certain sense of understanding technique that is what elevates any creative endeavor, whether it's um, totally Photoshop and knowing how to use it as a tool or knowing how to use a sewing machine. I love the way that you talk about it in evolutionary terms, that once we had more food and shelter that was secured for us, that we were able to focus more on some of these like aesthetics of the way that we present ourselves to the world. And then furthermore, once we got into like the industrial revolution age, it went a lot from the, <clears throat> similar to the, the printing press, you had to write a Bible by hand or a book by right. hand, then you could just and print so it them it was all. a very special thing to have that Bible. Yeah. When everyone can have a Bible, it did two things. It leveled the playing field because now everyone has the same information. Yeah. And though doesn't have to go to a secondary person to disseminate that information to them. You don't have to go to your priest and ask him, what does the Bible say about so-and-so? And he regurgitates that to you. You now have your own copy. You can look it up for yourself. What that also does, unfortunately, um, and this is with whether it's clothing or with anything, it allows people who perhaps don't have the full knowledge of what it is they now have in their hand to make their own interpretation without doing the homework first. And so when it came to things like clothing, anybody could go out there and produce you know, their line of jeans if they wanted to. But the quality control necessarily wasn't great because they weren't even involved in it. They would send it overseas and have it done so-and-so and they'd have a thing and they didn't care if it lasted long or not because in a season it's going to be gone anyway and I move on to the next thing. One of the things about me being able to do it here is that I, um, I'm responsible, good or bad, for what I produce to someone. And so I have to make sure that it's, it's what I want it to present. I'm... I'm, I want to also showcase all of this other, there's so much <laughs> more to, to showcase. And, right, and so the highlight. masks were the thing that started, but really uh, my cuffs and, and clothing and things are the things that really would be the second one in. These are called cuffs and clothing. Yep. Oh, first one for you, because you're first a man. because you I'm big. big wrists. Oh. There you go. <laughs> so, and we, we, you know, these are. So that'll be on my, that's a piece that I actually produced unless I sell it beforehand, it's gonna go on my, uh, my first show, which is next year. So this is, it was dubiously called the spider cuff, because it kind of looks like a spider. Yeah, and there's yeah. a, you know, when I first. I think that was like the first thing you ever tried on of mine. When I first met you in like in around May, you know, here's that, oh, here's, you the, up, here's, that here's that picture, you know? And I, I do really like this piece. It's, it's, it reminds me a lot of kind of like a Star Trekian future. I, I really like that about it. It also, it's, it's very uh, arachnid as well. It's very. It is. Um, yeah. So also I really kind of like looks like Sputnik it. a little. It close. looks like Sputnik a little. Yeah. <laughs> and you have a bunch of different designs like this. <clears throat> and. Yeah, I like sharp things. Yeah. Yeah. I'll yeah. gravitate towards it. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, so. So let's, you know, you, you know, you, you started us off into the direction of talking about. Sure. Yeah, so talk about things that are 
that are the masks is what got you going. Right, but you there's... sold half of your masks. Oh, I sold more of it. Uh, but you that sold now. half on your first like exhibit, did, yeah. which was that's huge. It was great. And then that, like you said, that was really um, inspirational for you to continue making. And... Well, it made me feel like I, I was able to do it and not do it in a hackneyed kind of way. You know, I didn't want it to be a craft project. If I was going to do it, just like my paintings, um, I wanted it to be an, an elevated version of it. Um, there are not, you know, I've, I have a, a very small list of people who are influences in my life as far as fashion goes, because. It's not what I went to school for, but I definitely did my research and found people who inspired me and uses. And then when I would find those inspirations, it wasn't just about, okay, well, I like the way that looks, but it was more, well, how did that person go about producing that? What was, how do I think that they got from point A to point C? Um, and that I would do a lot of trial and error. You know, I have a, totally. I have a drawer downstairs totally. of things that were good ideas, but not, yeah. Not viable. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, to get to a point of say something like this. <clears throat> so this was actually cut <clears throat> on uh, the the metal piece of this was cut on a. Um, uh, wow, this is a really water, light. A water jet. Yeah. This is on a water so jet, light. and I wanted to create something that sort of held its shape, was in, you can bend it, um, very flexible, and would fit anybody. And so yeah, so exactly just like that. So, so that was a cool piece, but that was totally designed in CAD and like, what is the shape I want? And then we laid out, and then we took the CAD file, flattened it out, and then I had that cut on um, a lathe. So. Yeah, that tech right, and this is so light. What is it's, this? It's aluminum. It's this aluminum. is aluminum. It's aluminum, yeah. um, and then it's been hand pounded. So the shape Which on it. Which is what you get when Right, you so you do get that, that nice yeah. texture the on texture it. The texture makes right. it look mid then, medieval. Right, yeah. medieval, kind of veiny a little veiny, bit. Veiny, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. But yeah, light as a feather, um, very, very strong, flexible. So but what's light. nice about it is it's one of those pieces that anybody can wear. You just adjust it quickly. It can fit a man, a woman, which with accessories is not usually the case. It's usually you have to have a look lot of buckles that. and a lot of look things. Look at that. Just where you so, go, fuke. Yep. Fuke, boom. I love that piece. It's such a good piece. I haven't piece. named it yet, so. Do you name know. all your pieces? For myself, I do, just <coughs> so I have an idea of what it, what it was, and so if people want to uh, reference it or, 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 or look it up, they can. But I also feel like some of them just have a natural tendency to, to need to be named. Like these guys here, this is one of the first things. I produced eight of these, and this is the last one that I have. Let me see it. Um, so this was cut on a laser cutter, and then the inside is actually a wireframe, and it was named by my client, Kim, who I adore as the Dirty Lily for obvious reasons. The Dirty uh, Lily? Right. Why? Uh, you know, Why? Boing, you know. Boing? Uh, oh, is that right. is, is I mean, supposed to be a cl clitoris? It's not necessarily <laughs> literal interpretation, but there's a, there's a, there's a soft reference there. So that's a beautiful soft reference. Right, it's a beautiful I like soft this reference. soft reference. Right, it's yeah. a lovely soft reference. So um, where does this, is this a necklace? It's a necklace, yeah. Oh, wow. It's a necklace. You can put it on. Um, but yeah, no, it's a necklace. But that whole pattern for the flower itself is cut on a laser cutter. Um, there's a front and a back, and then there's a metal mesh inside, and then the entire thing is sewn. Um, and uh, there you go. And so that's that piece. But again, it's very flexible. So if you were to say squish it or bend it, it just bends right back into its own shapes and, and stuff, and it's silver, and right. And then you just bend it back, and you're all good to go. Um, it's really so, interesting, yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's a cool, but it was, it's funny because it was one of those things where I, I made it and I liked it and I did a version in gold and did a version in silver and I, I couldn't keep them in. So you I, couldn't keep them in, they were no, flying. No, I, made, flying. I, I've made, I, I believe I've made eight of them so far and this is the last one. So something like that was great because I was like, well, I can't, I'm never going to get it to be the same. So being able to cut it out in a laser cutter was great because I was able to go quickly. But then so wait, stitch it by hand. And Do you consider making eight or 16 more of those ever? Well, I decided if I'm going to do it, I'm going to have them ready to go, and then I don't have to worry about it. Um, it was, this is probably one of the few things I've ever done in a real production sense. There's a photo of them up here, I think, at least four of them. So you can see the, the gold ones and, and all that. If you go up a little, there they are. Nope, bottom. Keep going up. That one with the red background. Oh, yeah. Um, so I made uh, four in gold, four in silver, um, and that was them. They had a different cording at the time. I actually ended up changing it. This, this last one I ended up putting a chain on, but they had a lot of different cording at the time. Um, 
But that's one of the few things I've ever done as a real production. Most of what I do is I'll make one or two and then I'll decide whether or not I'm going to do more based on whether it's a success. And then, so. So, and then how do you decide whether or not to make more of those? You know? um, if I get a request or if it seems if like they flew off the shelf. They flew off the shelf. I mean, one of the things that have sold really well for me on here um, are those little fur cuffs right here, right These, there. Yeah, 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 I saw this uh, one earlier. This is the this third is one of that. Again, it's a, it's a laser cut piece on the center. Um, wow. Right. Um, and then the rest is, it's pony skin and pony cashmere. Pony skin, cashmere. Um, and then wow. it's a, it just buckles on. Um, yeah. But I made one of those, sold. I made another one, sold. So this is the, the third one. But you know, having a pattern for that is certainly helpful. Yeah, there you go. You got it. There you go. So yeah, that's a cool piece. But it is things a like really that. interesting piece. But you know, then there's things like the masks are really, those are obviously going to be one off because the amount of time it takes to make. And if someone buys something like one of those masks, they probably want to be the only one that has it. Now I've made things that are yeah. similar because people, you know, say, oh, do you have any more of that? And you say you don't, so you make another one. But I don't, I get bored pretty quickly. You want to keep so the creating idea of, new things. So, so if you made like 16 of those, it would be kind of like... Yeah, a, I'm not going to probably make any more of those. This is the last one. So anybody wants it, let me know. Um, wow. Now I'm going to move on to other things because for, for myself... And do most people go purchase through your DMs through my, on Instagram? Through my Instagram, but also, I mean, I have, I have a very lovely clientele here in the city um, of, of regular clients who are always purchasing things and, supportive, um, yeah. and so I've, I've been lucky in that way uh, mostly though people will, will will message me and say hey a friend of mine was wearing such and such and do you have it anymore and I'll either say yes or no but I can create one for you if you'd like and you should come to my studio and I have people come over a lot and pick what they like pick what they I like, like people yeah. to be involved so they can another laser cut leather um, on the back of that is actually really an interesting material it's from the 30s it's real silver thread um, so the, the, the metallic yeah, part. Yep. So it's from the 30s. You actually have to polish it because it's a real silver threading. Um, so a, a, quick, a quick question. This is totally silver threading. It's, it's very it's interesting. Um, and now quick, a quick question is um, <clears throat> you said that you, you, know, you get bored easily because you want to make new things and you want to, and people want to be the only person but in the that world that has right, this. Right, and that's part of having a niche, which is great, is me being able to say to a certain degree, there is only one of these, and so if you want, you want it, come get it. Uh, but it's like anything. If you go to a, a car showroom, usually the car you see on the floor is not the one you end up buying. You say, I like that car, but can I have it in red? Yeah, yeah. A lot of times I'll have people say, I really like this, but I'd love you to make me one in gold. So I will go, well, I can make you something similar. I have it you know, I have this and this and this and let's yeah. lay it out and work with it and it becomes a collaborative thing. Yeah. Which is what's cool about it. I like the collaboration aspect of it. I like being able to create something for someone that has an idea in their head but they don't really have the ability to make it themselves. And yeah. so I end up becoming that conduit yeah. that gets to say, this is how we can create that, that piece you want. Whether it's, you know, a cool piece of jewelry or a mask or, you know, as, as you see here, what I'm getting started with, which is my first real fashion show. So, so, now, t so now tell us, where, where is your time being allocated between masks, um, uh, uh, bra uh, what are the bracelet? Cuffs. Cuffs. Cuffs, cuffs masks, and uh, dresses. Well, at the moment, the cuffs and the masks have paid for me to be able to have the ability to make the dresses. Gotcha. So yes. um, I'm starting to really finish up a lot of the things that I have that are half finished in my studio for the accessories. And at the beginning of the year, I'm gonna focus solely on my show, which I'm planning to have around this time next year. Um, a, a show of, of... Of dresses, yeah. Of I'm, dresses I'm, while people are also wearing Not necessarily. Um, Maybe not, okay. No, I have, an, I have a, a bit of an idea, and the masks are, have been wonderful, and I'll always wanna sort of pay tribute to it. And I may have one or two in my show, but I want to be able to move pass that as not being a one trick pony. Totally. So I'm gonna incorporate a lot of the things that I've learned by, by using engineering and design and, and that along with being able to create something on a larger scale, which I like with 
more with, right. more, more people will wear um, right and you're also just going to be able to have somebody feel uh, they can get more use out of it you know it, it, it's something that you you're able to to create on a larger a larger scale they don't wear it once and put it on the wall right now lance give us a quick idea um are we talking you know these are like a couple hundred dollars and these are a couple thousand dollars <laughs> now i feel like i'm on an infomercial um they, they range um generally my cuffs are between 200 and 400 dollars depending on what For goes the into cuffs. them yep. what goes okay. into them yep the masks range between eight and twelve hundred dollars okay cool. um and again it depends on on what went into it um that's not to say that that's a a hard case scenario. I had a mask that's on here, which is all porcupine quills and crystal, which was the finale piece Jeez. of our New York show, and that was over two thousand dollars, and that sold to Whoa. a lovely lady. Is that further down? Uh, probably. Yeah. If you go down to, there's a model wearing a bunch of my masks. Uh, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. We'll get to the whole area where they're all wearing the masks. There you go. There she is. So that one there. Oh, whoa. So that piece was the finale piece for Emily's and my show in New York. Um, and that piece sold. It was Swarovski crystal and chrome and like 48 wow. individual porcupine quills. And each one wow. was set individually with a little screw so they could all be taken off and reassembled. Damn. Um, so that piece sold. Um, this last Halloween, which was great, and the lady who bought it was lovely. I don't, I don't want to say her name because I don't want to embarrass her, but totally. she uh, is, is a cancer survivor. Wow! And she was having a party, and she had shaved her head, and she didn't have any hair at the time. And she said, "I saw this was in a window, yeah. in a window display." Uh, and she said, "I saw it in the window, and I came back to it three weeks later, and I really, really want it because I want to be able to wear something that's going to make me feel really." confident because right now I'm not feeling super confident. Yeah. And so she ended up purchasing it and I ended up adjusting it a little bit for her um, because it's all metal. And she said she had a great time. She sent me a picture of her wearing it and uh, I don't know, it was one of the cooler experiences with it. Yeah. Because when I had made it, I figured that piece, if anybody ever bought it, it was going to be some rich kid who can afford it and wear it once and it's probably gonna get destroyed. And so I had made my peace with the fact that, you know, probably gonna be somebody who isn't gonna appreciate it. I'll, I'll cash the check and then I'll never see it again. Mm -hmm. The fact that it went to somebody who used it for a special occasion. Yes. And then it has it on her, on her mantle as something that she can put on and sort of feel grr about it after having fought cancer. Like that was kind of cool to me. And then, you so, know, on our, yeah, absolutely, on that's our a, way. That, there's no better thing a designer can get than to get someone like that who's really genuinely moved by something that you create. Not just like, yes. oh, I think it's pretty, I'd like to have it, but this piece really moves me, I want to have it. To me, that's awesome. That's so. awesome, yeah. Now, okay, now you're transitioning to the show, and so yeah. you're focusing a lot more of your time on next year's I, show. I am. I was really lucky. A um, client of mine who's also a friend, um, Kim, uh, who is, Kim's been a, a, a client of mine probably from the very beginning, one of the, the, the biggest supporters of mine. Uh, she worked in finance and she and I talked and, and, and stuff and I told her, you know, I really want to have it my first show, but I don't know how to go about it and I don't know how to raise funds for it and I also, I'm a little nervous of what if it's a big failure and I said, and I don't want to go into debt over it, you know, I live, I'm not a rich person. And so her idea was, she said, well, do what they would do in any industry and you need to find someone to uh, become a, um, a patron. And so the, the business model we came up with very quickly was uh, if I tapped enough people to basically sponsor a dress before it was produced, mm -hmm. I was able to raise capital beforehand. And what you're doing is purchasing a dress sight unseen and once it's produced, it's now yours, but you're buying it a year in advance. Ah. And so by being able to do that, I was able to have a little bit of capital, get all the materials, materials I needed, like what you've need. seen down there, yeah. and start focusing on the show. But the genius aspect of it is, is when the show comes out, I'll be able to say before it ever hit the runway that 10 of the pieces sold. 
Yeah. Which is great for PR. Exactly. So good idea, Kim. Thanks. Um, So I'm focusing on that now because I want to have my show probably around this time next year. Lance, we are so excited to be help out with the show next year. I would love to help out. Well, I'm going to need somebody to do some videography for it. Awesome. We'll get the word out. We'll do videography. (laughs) We would love to do that. Awesome. This is. I'd love for you guys to be there. This is the future of fashion. You you're very sustainable. You're very, you know, you're very focused on technology, on all the different aspects that you can plug to make this um, sustainable as well with tech. And also just the, you know, the sheer amount of just eccentricity. It's just so, you know, it's Well, very there are different. so many things that are, that we barely, um, An eclectic barely well. touched on in, the, in, in fashion That's that right. are coming up. Things like nanotechnology that people are going to be incorporating sooner than you think into clothing, with you know things that the idea of being able to have clothing that built into it have microbe eating abilities, so you don't have to change your shirt every day mm. because you are literally cleaning it as you wear it. Mm-hmm. Because th- that technology is being is being developed right developed now, right now yeah. in, in Japan, um, or things like natural leathers, quote unquote, that are a lot healthier for the environment than say what we call vegan leather now, which is really just vinyl, mm-hmm. um, not very good for the environment. It, it it's, creates a whole different cadre of problems that aren't much better for the world than emissions from a cow farm. Um, but if you mycelium do, as leather. Right, mycelium is, but if you use something, say the, a leather that's created from bacteria, which is a screening of sugar, and then that sugar solidifies and it creates this, this hard substance that you can not only you know, cut and, and color and do all these things with, but that leaves no natural gases, there's no extra runoff from it because it colors itself naturally. These are all things that are being down the pipeline that people are going to be using in the future, and I'm excited to be able to use that kind of stuff in what I do. To be able exactly. to literally take a mold of your torso mm-hmm. and grow a shirt around you that has no seams and that fits you perfectly and Whoa. is breathable yeah. and that is made specifically for you and that can not only draw out the heat from you when you're feeling hot, but can also insulate you when you're getting cold. Mm-hmm. Those are all things that are literally being produced right now in a very small scale and in development. but as it progresses and it, you know, the, the way that we have things go from point A to point C nowadays is remarkably fast because we have that ability to do rapid prototyping. You're going to see these things on the market within the next three to five years easily and readily available to anybody. And as people latch on to it, the price point will come down. Uh, like any new technology, it's, totally. it starts high, but it will come back down. And I think when people see that ability to really be involved in what they wear and not just bite off the rack, but be able to say, this is something that I had a hand in. Yeah. People will feel invested in the technology in and of itself. I think yeah. that that's important. Even in the smallest way, when I have someone come in and they pick the, the, the they leather that they like, in you. They, they become invested in the thing that they're, they're procuring. Yeah. Because it's not just I went and I picked a nice, you know, belt from, uh, you know, Dior. Mm-hmm. But I had involvement in this, so I'm more likely to take care of this piece. I'm more likely to not just throw it out when I'm tired of it and fill up a landfill. These are all things that, that contribute too, because if someone feels invested in whatever they're putting their money into, they're more likely to take care of it, which also helps the environment, because you're less likely to just chuck it when you're done. Like, it's not an H&M t-shirt. Exactly. Now, so. you were listing all these technologies that are coming up, and it was so cool, you know, seeing you caring about them and, and teaching us about how they're coming into our world. It's, Lance, it's so cool seeing artists like you that are designers of fashion that are able to come into the world with success because people have found their work to be meaningful and want to support them. And we love that on the show. We love the artists that are breaking through into the world. And this has been such a pleasure sitting down with you. Well, thank you for supporting the arts and and having me on. I've been uh, happy to to come up and show you a little bit of what I work on. But more importantly, it's it's cool that hopefully this inspires other designers, younger people who are working on it to know that 
it's easier to create something quick and disposable, but you'll have much more ability to feel pride in what you do if you take the time to not only suss out where you're buying things from and how you're procuring them, but taking the time to really get to know what you're working with will make you appreciate and value your own work, which inevitably will make other people value your work too. I love and that. That's, that's what couture is all about. So That's what couture is all about. I, I, I love the way that you're talking about the young audiences and, and putting in longer time sustainable sourcing technology. I think it's, it, it's an unfortunate trade-off from the remarkable ability that we have now to be able to find and access knowledge at, at a given second. That's wonderful. I think being able to say, I want this and I want to know about this right now is amazing. The downside to that is people's attention spans are, are minuscule. And so you find a lot of designers in fashion especially where their ability to think about what they want is there, but their ability to actually create it is absolutely not. And, Same thing and, with almost every other creative Right, field. so yeah. they don't really care about the process, they just want to see the end result. I have this idea in my head and I want to see it, so I'm going to go to the quickest route to get to that thing. If you actually know how to create that dress from the beginning and how to cut a pattern, where those fabrics come from, what goes into being able to dye those fabrics and how horrendous it can be on the environment, you're more likely to try and find alternatives that will fit your narrative but still allow you to sleep at night. But also, on the other aspect, you will learn through having to produce it on your own a real skill set that nobody can take away from you. It's easy if you have the monetary cachet to be able to hire someone else to do something for you and produce your idea. That's mm -hmm. how 99% of all fashion designers do it. Mm -hmm. They're the designer and someone else creates it. Mm -hmm. When I'm someone who not only designs it, but finds my materials and creates them, I'm in control of that whole system, but I'm also responsible for it, which makes me accountable. And being accountable for your creativity and what you put into the world is just as important as having the idea to put it into there. Yep, yep. Because Lance, you have to be accountable. Yep, yep. Lance, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Uh, what do I think the most beautiful thing in the world is? People being true to themselves and not really caring what others think. I love it, man. I love it so much. <laughs> what a good answer. What a beautiful endeavor that you have. Go and check out Lance's links below in the bio. Um, also, go and build the future. Go manifest your destiny into the world, everyone. Go and be yourself, your fullest self and go and put that hard work in. And leave us your thoughts in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks everyone for tuning in and for watching. We greatly appreciate it. Thanks for Ron for producing and directing. Much love to you. And we will see you soon everyone. Much love. Peace.